for presenting today. So Dr. Ottman is Professor of Epidemiology and Neurology at the Sergevsky Center and Deputy Director for Research at the Sergevsky Center, Columbia University. She's also a research scientist in the Division of Epidemiology, New York State Psychiatric Institute, and the Deputy Director of the Columbia Center for Research on Ethical, Legal, and Social Implications of Psychiatric, Neurologic, and Behavioral Genetics. Dr. Ottman. Well done, that's a mouthful. <laughs> Dr. Ottman is a genetic epidemiologist whose research addresses the role of inherited factors and susceptibility to neurologic disorders, primarily focusing on epilepsy. She's a major collaborator in the Epilepsy Phenome Genome Project and in the Epi4K Center Without Walls for Collaborative Research in the Epilepsies. Her research group was the first to recognize the epilepsy syndrome, autosomal dominant epilepsy with auditory features, and to identify LGI1 as a major susceptibility gene for the disorder. She's currently researching the clinical and psychosocial impact of genetic information on individuals with epilepsy and their family members. So with that, I'm gonna turn the call over to Dr. Ottman. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? I guess uh, I won't be able to hear you because you've got your, <laughs> your telephone and, and uh, web connections muted, but uh, I hope you can hear me okay and that somebody will be able to complain if good. I see people chatting saying that they can hear. Great. Okay, so we'll just get going. Um, and I'm going to keep an eye on that chat box so that I can see if you have questions that come up along the way. Uh, and I would really like you to, you know, as, as I think Amy said, I'd like this to be an interactive session so that you can tell me if, if something occurs to you that you want to make a comment or ask a question. Um, so let's get going. Um, as you all know, there's been strong evidence of a genetic contribution to the epilepsies for many, many, many years. I mean, hundreds of years. And this has come from observing families where multiple individuals are affected. It's come from formal twin studies where concordance rates are higher in identical or monozygotic twins than in fraternal or dizygotic twins. It comes from studies of experimental animals where they can be bred for seizure susceptibility. And finally, of course, more recently, it comes from actual identified genes. But it, it's a little bit paradoxical because uh, even though we know that genetics is important in epilepsy, only a minority of patients have a family history of the disorder. And you can see here, I've summarized data from five studies. Um, and I would say a median value would be about 10% of patients have a family history in first degree relatives. And this is probably what you've seen, you know, in, in clinical experience as well. You know, it's rare to find a family, find a patient that reports having affected relatives. So why is that? It's because the genetic contributions to the epilepsies are genetically complex uh, for the most part. I mean, there's a small fraction of epilepsies that uh, have a Mendelian mode of inheritance or that are associated with chromosomal abnormalities or due to mitochondrial gene abnormalities, but the vast majority are genetically complex. What we mean by that is, you know, there are a number of contributors to the complexity. Uh, one of them is, is that for many people with epilepsy, the cause the genetic contribution is polygenic, meaning there are many genes that contribute to risk, but each of them only has a tiny effect. Um, and another model involving multiple genes is oligogenic, uh, which implies that there are smaller sets of contributing genes, each with a modest effect. So if this is what's happening, you're not going to see families very often that have multiple affected individuals. Other complexities are gene-gene interaction or combined effects of different genes, gene environment interaction, 
combined effects of genes and environmental exposures. And this would be really important to find uh, environmental exposures that cause epilepsy. But other than the ones that have a really major effect, like stroke or severe head trauma um, or brain infection, we don't have identified environmental exposures so far, for the most part. I think that would be a very, very important finding. Um, but we think, in theory, that the genes uh, must combine with some sort of environmental exposures. And another very important attribute of this complexity is genetic and etiologic heterogeneity. So, you know, we divide up the epilepsies into syndromes, but even when you're talking about a narrowly defined syndrome, there are different causal mechanisms in different people. Um, and some and even when when you only refer to the genetic subset of, of a syndrome, um, there may be different genes that are involved in different families. So that makes it very complex as well. So I'm going to start by talking a bit about the big picture, talking about familial risks of the epilepsies. And this, I think, is, for the moment at least, the most relevant uh, data that I can show you for clinical purposes, because this is the information that's going to tell you about uh, risks in the offspring of a person with epilepsy. And that's what people with epilepsy want to know about. Um, the reason we rely on empirical risk estimates is that we can't really estimate risk based on a genetic model because few patients have mutations and genes identified so far. So, um, you know, we can't use genetic testing in most patients to estimate risk in the relatives. And also because the most epilepsies don't follow a Mendelian pattern like autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, et cetera, the risks that we would get from a Mendelian model just don't apply. So in order to estimate familial risks, we need to get good epidemiologic information. And that information, this comes from the field of genetic epidemiology, you know, where we're combining understanding of genetics with understanding of epidemiologic principles. So we're looking for data where uh, where we have information on each relative and where we, we, we believe that the information is accurate and where we know something about the age of the relatives so that we can um, estimate the risks throughout life of the relatives because obviously risks change with age and where we are pretty sure that recall bias is not influencing our estimates of risk. And we also want to avoid selection bias. So there have been a lot of studies like this that have used uh, data from patients attending a clinic, for example. And really, it's much better if we have population-based data where all epilepsy cases in the population are included regardless of family history or type of epilepsy, because both of those things can impact familiar, the estimates of familial risk. And also, we want to have data on incidence cases, because if we were to rely on prevalence cases, we would have a sample that might be biased by the outcome or prognosis of a particular uh, subgroup. So, those are basic epidemiologic principles that we want to follow. There have been a few studies that meet those criteria, but one of them is a study that my group did. Um, and it was based on population-based information from the Rochester Epidemiology Project. Um, so it's rare in the United States to find a situation where you can actually do a population-based study. But this is one of them, because 
the city of Rochester, Minnesota, uh, is where the Mayo Clinic is located. It's in southeastern Minnesota. And it's relatively isolated from other major urban areas. And so, and because uh, people get very high quality care in that area, there have been a lot of studies showing that they do stay in at the Mayo Clinic or or see physicians that are uh, nearby and that are included in this uh, system uh, where you can identify all of the incidence cases with a disorder. So it's really a unique situation because you know that you can capture all of the cases that have incidence of epilepsy among people who live there because people don't really go outside. So the uh, Rochester Epidemiology Project includes the Mayo Clinic and a few, and one other major medical care uh, facility called the Olmsted Medical Group, and a few, historically a few private practices that were in the area as well. And they have brought together all of the medical records from all of these providers which, as I said, really include all of the places where people who live there go for their medical care. So it's really a unique situation. And what we did was we um, identified all of the incident cases uh, who were living in the city of Rochester, uh, who were born after 1920, and had incidents of unprovoked seizures from 1935 to 1994, so a 60-year period. And there were 660 people who had incidents of epilepsy during that time. And then because it's this population-based system, we were actually able to also identify the first-degree relatives who resided in the area. And we did that by looking carefully at the medical records that mentioned the parents of cases, by following the marriage and birth announcements, obituaries. And we could identify from this big system of medical records all of the relatives of these epilepsy cases, and then review the medical records of those relatives to figure out which ones of them had had uh, incidents of epilepsy. And so we could compare the incidence rate in the relatives with the incidence rates in the general population. These are data, if you look on this x, <clears throat> x axis, that's age of the relatives. And this uh, y axis is the cumulative incidence of epilepsy. So what we're doing is essentially reconstructing <clears throat> the lifetime experience of the relatives and, and of the general population as they move through these different age periods. And you can see that for offspring, siblings, and parents, the cumulative incidence of epilepsy by the time they reach about 40 is around, well, it's around 4.7% 4, 4 when you put everyone together. Not much difference between offspring, siblings, and parents. Um, and the, in the general population, the cumulative incidence was 1.3%. So you can see, you know, risk is increased. It's not radically increased, but it is increased. And we, if we take all of these data and put them together, we can summarize them in a standardized incidence ratio, which is kind of like a relative risk, uh, and say that the risk is increased about threefold in the first degree relatives of a person with epilepsy. Um, and of course, that varies depending on what type of epilepsy the person has. One of the strongest predictors is um, the cause of epilepsy, how we classify the case with regard to cause. And this here we've used the term idiopathic to refer to um, mostly people with generalized epilepsy of unknown cause. It's what people are now calling genetic generalized epilepsy, but I don't really agree with using that term. I think it's confusing and oversimplifying. I call it idiopathic still. Um, 
So we found about a five-fold increased risk in the relatives of those people. The, these are mostly IgEs. Um, these are people who, who had epilepsy of unknown cause. And here we are using the newer classification. And these are focal cases where a cause was not identified. And the risk is increased to a smaller extent, but about threefold. In significantly increased. And if you look at the cases that have structural identified causes, whether they're structural or metabolic, um, those that fell into this group of prenatal developmental had about a fourfold increased risk. So uh, this was a pretty striking finding. And these people were, uh, they even had the cases with prenatal developmental causes, most of these had intellectual disability. And we say prenatal because they something happened probably before birth that caused them to have epilepsy, which is why they had intellectual disability with their epilepsy. Um, and they had an increased risk in their relatives, not only of epilepsy associated with intellectual disability, but also of epilepsy of unknown cause. So that, that's an interesting group that probably shares genes with the epilepsies of unknown cause. Those that had an identified genetic cause did not have, we, ha we found no affected relatives. And these were things like Down syndrome and other uh, chromosomal abnormalities, most of them. Um, and the ones that had a postnatal cause and this is something like a stroke, severe head injury, et cetera, uh, did not have a significant increased risk in their relatives. So when you divide them up by syndrome, and looking at the ones where the risk seemed to be increased based on the cause of epilepsy, people who had IgEs, 8% of their relatives, 8 8% of their relatives were affected by the time they reached age 40. The prenatal developmental group was about 6%. The focal unknown cause, 2.9%. And I've gone back and forth here between talking about the percent of the relatives who are affected versus the uh, standardized incidence ratio. So here on this slide, I'm talking about the standardized incidence ratio as opposed to the actual risk in the relatives. These risks are actually you know, the most important statistic to think about in terms of genetic counseling. Um, and interestingly, since the risk in the general population up to age 40 is about 1%, these figures turn out to be very close to uh, the standardized incidence ratios. <laughs> so. But these are the ones you should think about in terms of genetic counseling. Now, there's another phenomenon that's really important to bear in mind. And it's a mysterious phenomenon. And that has, is called the maternal effect. Um, we have observed this. And in fact, I've reviewed the literature quite extensively on this topic. And every study that has ever looked at off risks in offspring of men and women with epilepsy has found that the risk is higher in the offspring of a female patient than in the offspring of a male patient. And it's, so it's a very consistent finding across studies. And I have spent a lot of effort trying to understand it. And it's still not explained. Um, from this study, which uh, was published about two years ago, um, we were able to observe that this phenomenon is not a high risk in the offspring of the women, but rather an absence of an increased risk in the offspring of the men. So if you look here at this blue line, the offspring of the men did not have significantly increased risk compared with the population. But if you look at the offspring of the women, it's about the same as we observed in parents, siblings, and offspring of all cases. Um, and 
these findings are not consistent with reporting bias. I mean, you might think that women would be better able to report on their offspring than men. But remember, these data are not based on reporting. They're based on reviewing the medical records of the offspring. Um, the data are not consistent with X linkage because we don't see an effect of the sex of the offspring, only the sex of the parent. Um, and we've ruled out an effect of either intrauterine exposure to maternal anti-epileptic medications or seizures during pregnancy. So that also doesn't explain it. Um, so, so it's really a mysterious finding. Um, and in the past, we've thought about things like mitochondrial inheritance, but we have not seen a consistently higher risk in mothers than in fathers of the cases. So it doesn't seem to be consistent with mitochondrial inheritance either. Very mysterious. And my uh, best guess now is, especially given that what we're seeing is an absence of increased risk in the offspring of the males, I think it might be that men who have genetic forms of epilepsy are less likely to reproduce than are women with genetic forms of epilepsy. Uh, and that's what we have called selective fertility. So it's, but it's a mysterious uh, phenomenon and one that needs more attention in terms of research. OK, and now the slide is not advancing. There we go. Now, another really important part of understanding epilepsy genetics is to think about disease-causing genes. And we've made a lot of progress on identifying particular genes that cause epilepsy. Um, and this is important for two different reasons. One, we want to learn about the, gen the mechanisms that lead to epilepsy. And identifying genes can help us with efforts to get biological insights. And obviously, that, we hope, would lead to development of new therapeutic targets, biomarkers, and prevention. Um, but on the other hand, and this is a big discussion now, we want to find ways of predicting onset of epilepsy in individual patients. And this is where precision medicine comes in and personalized medicine. And that also will improve our ability to uh, get a good prognosis for a person. Uh, now the current situation is when a patient comes in, you don't know whether he's going to be in that one third who does not have seizure control or in the two thirds that does have seizure control. And understanding the genes should help us to make better predictions and to optimize therapies and to make a more rapid diagnosis. So there are two basic reasons we want to identify genes. This uh, is a, a history of what's happened with gene discovery in the epilepsies. So, um, and this has happened very recently, only in the last 20 years. The first human epilepsy gene was identified in 1995. That was the alpha-4 subunit of the neuronal nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, CHRNA4, in a focal epilepsy syndrome that was at that time called autosomal dominant nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsy. Um, and then following that gene identification throughout the 1990s, uh, a lot of genes were identified. Well, about 20 or so genes were identified. Um, and we saw an emerging picture that many of them encoded voltage-gated or ligand-gated ion channels. And so the whole concept of that epilepsy was an ion channelopathy uh, began to emerge. 
And the method that was used to identify genes at that time was really uh, finding big families that looked like they had Mendelian inheritance and uh, using a method called linkage analysis to uh, hone in on the chromosomal region that was likely to contain the gene and then looking at the genes in that region to try to identify which one was really causing the disease. So there was a lot of success at that time because the focus was on big Mendelian families. But then in the early uh, 2000s, uh, a lot of small candidate gene association studies were done. And many of them had non-reproducible results. And they were, they were small. And you know the history of choosing a candidate gene that you think might be involved in a disorder and investigating whether or not the variants in that gene are associated with the disorder has not been very successful uh, in many disorders because we just don't know enough about the molecular mechanisms to, to, to choose the genes very well. Um, but in the last five years or so, there's been major progress in gene identification. And this comes with the advent of newer technologies like genome sequencing. So um, in just last year, there was a meeting where we discussed precision medicine in the epilepsies. And this paper that's referenced, uh, published in Lancet Neurology, summarizes uh, some of the discussions at that meeting and provides a list of more than 70 genes that uh, have been discovered so far in various forms of epilepsy uh, uh, and where the authors uh, believe that the evidence was strong enough to actually call them an epilepsy gene. So the number is radical, you know, dramatically increasing. There's really been an explosion of new findings. And not only does this come from sequencing, but another major, major important thing is that there are large international collaborative studies going on. Uh, so people are really pooling their resources uh, and able to uh, get much larger sample sizes and uh, pull together expertise from a lot of different types of arenas, like uh, not only epileptology, but also epidemiology, statistical genetics, basic science. And all of those play a big role in, in this effort. Um, and so there have been a number of breakthroughs. One is that copy number variants are important in the epilepsies. Uh, secondly, uh, a lot of gene discovery in, the de in, in terms of de novo genomic variation. That is, uh, mutations that occur that are not inherited from the parents, but occur de novo during the process of gametogenesis uh, in one or the other of the parents. And this is happening, uh, this has been found to be a major, major force in the epileptic encephalopathies. So we've made a lot of progress in those very, very severe forms of epilepsy. And there's also research going on on somatic mutations in the focal epilepsies. So um, genomic changes that occur uh, after the formation of the zygote at some form, point during development and that may be expressed in, mosaically uh, in, the, in the later tissues. So that's another major effort. Um, so copy number variants are deletions or duplications of the DNA. Uh, they can range from about 1,000 bases to several million bases. And they can involve one or more genes. And you see this uh, diagram uh, showing a deletion where, um, where uh, one of the copies of the trying to figure out what's been deleted here, where, where part of the, a segment of the DNA containing one of more genes has been removed. Yes, there's a deletion of C. Okay. Uh, 
Um, and here, a duplication, where there's a, duplica uh, a duplication of C on one of the, um, on one of the chromosomes. Uh, and these are often de novo. And there are regions of the genome that have a lot of, uh, that, have, that have variation in the number of copies. So they are called recurrent uh, CNVs. Or there can be non-recurrent CNVs. So there are known regions of the genome where there's variation in the number of copies. And that's called a recurrent copy number variant. But then there are also uh, new de novo occurring uh, variations. And of course, these, the ones that are maintained in the population are less likely to be pathogenic. And the ones that are new, the non-recurrent ones, are more likely to be pathogenic. So what we've seen is that uh, if you look at recurrent CNVs, some of the, them are very strongly associated with epilepsy. Um, so for example, this 15Q13.3 micro deletion had been observed in intellectual disability and schizophrenia. And then it was found in up to 1% of patients with idiopathic generalized epilepsy. Uh, and it's very rare in the population, although it's still a recurrent CNV, it's rare. So when you, when you compare this 1% in patients with IgE with the population, you get a very high odds ratio of more than 50. Um, and these other two micro deletions, 16P13 and 15Q11, uh, have been found in a, about a half to 1% of epilepsy cases in both generalized and focal epilepsy. And again, these are also seen in autism, schizophrenia, intellectual disability, uh, ADHD. So providing some support for the hypothesis of shared genetic susceptibility to these neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, more recently, studies of non-recurrent CNVs uh, find that up to 5% of IgE cases have those. And there's also an enrichment for large CNVs and focal epilepsies. And in the epileptic encephalopathies, we also see a substantial proportion have these non-recurrent CNVs. Um, a couple of years ago, the, we had major success from the um, EPI4K consortium, uh, where we looked at trios both parents and a child, and searched for de novo genomic variation. And this is not CNVs now, now but single nucleotide variation um, in epileptic encephalopathies. And our paper was published in Nature, where we found a significant proportion of the cases, uh, about 10%, I believe, uh, had a de novo variation that we believed was pathogenic. Um, and then we put our data together with a European group, Euroepinomics, and found even greater evidence for this association. So uh, we were looking at infantile spasms or Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. And through whole exome sequencing, found that 12% of the individuals had a causal de novo mutation. And uh, we began to get some evidence for mechanism because many of these mutations disrupted a protein involved in regulating synaptic transmission. So we, we could learn something about the possible mechanism. So, there's an accumulation of evidence now. And so we're sort of chipping away at this big block of unknown causes of the epilepsies. But still, the vast majority of cases have an unknown cause. And I wanted to show you this uh, website because, um, you know, when I first started out in this field, I had a really, I, I was able to keep a file or even a table in Excel 
of gene discoveries. I had a list, and I was able to keep it in my brain even. Um, but now the number of genes, the field is moving so rapidly, and the number of genes that are being discovered day by day is so great that it's really impossible to keep up. And this is the blog of the ILAE Epilepsy Commission. And um, this blog was started by Ingo Helbig, who is a, a uh, clinical investigator uh, who's now at, at Penn, University of Pennsylvania. And it's just a fabulous, fabulous resource of information. So I'm going to show you here. Here, This is the epilepsiome. Ingo Helbig is really great at inventing words like that. So this is the epilepsiome. Um, and if we scroll down to SCN1A, for example, um, you know, SCN1A is probably the biggest player that we know of as far as a gene uh, involved in epilepsy. It seems to come up no matter what epilepsy you're thinking about. But, you know, you, you, here he has SCN1A. This is what you should know in 2015. And um, if you scroll down, SCN1A databases, population frequency, the role in febrile seizures, recessive variants. Um, and it's all summarized in a very easy to read and easy to understand way. Um, uh, and you can get on this mailing list and every month have information about some new thing that's happening in epilepsy genetics. Here is a clinician's guide to genetic test selection, navigating the Wild West. So I really highly recommend this. Um, I think that's the most important thing that I'm going to say today, is to read this blog. So what are the implications of these findings for clinical care? Um, well, of course, you know, genetic testing is now increasingly integrated into practice. It's particularly important in severe epilepsies of infancy and early childhood, such as the epileptic encephalopathies. And there are multiple modalities for genetic testing that are available. Um, So, you know, the older approach was that when you would do a genetic consultation or a patient consultation, um, you would collect detailed clinical information and family history. Um, and then you would ask yourself, is the history consistent with a known syndrome with an identified gene? And of course, this is a really hard question now with the rapidly moving gene identifications. And if it was not, you would simply provide empirical risk estimates. But now we have newer technologies that make it possible to, that, that greatly reduce the need to match a gene to a patient's syndrome. And this is a list of some of the uh, approaches that are available now. Chromosomal microarray is really probably the first line of effort in most cases. Um, it's, it's replaced karyotyping as a way of identifying chromosomal abnormalities. Um, single gene testing is also available if you know that the syndrome matches closely to, another, to a gene that's already been identified. But more often now, you would do a gene panel if you see some uh, evidence for matching of a gene, uh, match, for a syndrome matching to a set of genes. And finally now, increasingly, whole exome sequencing or, or even whole genome sequencing is going to be done. And that really, 
allows a much wider assessment of possible genetic effects. There are a number of types of clinical genetic testing, diagnostic, predictive, prenatal diagnosis, and carrier testing. Uh, the most important distinction is between diagnostic testing where you're trying to clarify the diagnosis in an individual already known to have epilepsy, or predictive and predictive testing where you're trying to predict the development of a disorder in an unaffected individual at risk uh, because of a family history. But you know, application of genetic testing raises a number of questions that I've summarized here. And as I said, it's very hard to keep up with answering those questions. The blog from Ingo Helbig will certainly help. Um, with, I'm going to skip over this a little bit, but I hope you will read it later. Uh, with diagnostic testing, there are a number of benefits. And with predictive testing, there are benefits. Even if you have a positive test from predictive testing, um, this could enable a person to prepare for possible onset. It could guide clinicians, patients, and family members to recognize onset. And it provides the possibility for some disorders of participating in pre-symptomatic trials. But all of the genetic testing that we've talked about comes with it potential risks. Um, and one of those is exacerbation of stigma, which actually might extend to the family members of an affected individual. And so I think that there are, when we're talking about diagnostic testing, the scales weigh heavily towards benefits, but with predictive testing, it's a bit more complicated to evaluate. Um, so, you know, I really tried to shorten this presentation, but I realize now it's still too long. Um, and I'm going to talk for five more minutes so that we have an opportunity for you to ask questions. Um, I was going to speak about how we evaluate whether or not a test should be done. And um, there, are, there is a, a, a protocol that has been developed that takes a look at analytic validity. Does the test accurately identify the syndrome? Clinical validity. Does the test predict whether or not a person has the disorder? clinical utility, which is what are the benefits and harms of the test, personal utility, does the test provide information likely to be useful other than clinically, and ethical, legal, and social issues. But <coughs> with epilepsy, we have one major problem, which is the genetic heterogeneity. So because these, the genes have such a, a limited correspondence with their phenotypic correlates, an individual who tests negative can still have the syndrome. Uh, and that's because a single syndrome can be caused by different genetic mechanisms in different people. So even in families that have Mendelian inheritance, you can have different genes involved and many individuals don't have a mutation in any previously identified gene. So what this means is that a negative gene test is often uninformative. <coughs> and a good example of this is the disorder that we used to call nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsy, but now we have changed the name to sleep-related hypermotor epilepsy, or SHE. And we changed the name because it's not always nocturnal, it's sleep-related, and it's not always frontal lobe. 
it's characterized by hypermotor seizures. So in this disorder, you know, we've made a lot of progress in the genetics. Five genes have been identified. And there are probably other genes that remain to be found. But most cases don't have any of those genes. And even structural uh, brain, structural abnormalities of the brain can be an underlying cause. And then on the other hand, we have variable expressivity, which implies that a positive gene test doesn't allow us to predict the outcome. And this is the case with SCN1A mutations in families with GEFs plus, where the phenotypes can vary in people who have the same genetic mutation from typical febrile seizures to very severe myoclonic astatic epilepsy. So um, I've been studying the impact of genetic testing in families that have multiple affected individuals. And we've been doing this by surveying people who have participated in my research in the past. Um, these are unusual families containing four or more affected individuals. And we've been surveying them and then offering a subset of the families, that is 11 or 20 families, uh, we've offered them testing for LGI1 mutations. And we've been following them closely through that process to see the impact on them of receiving the information. And we started out by asking them hypothetically, would you want genetic testing if it were offered? Uh, and we presented four scenarios. Uh, two of the scenarios were, were ones with clinical utility, that is, we said, the results of the test would help your doctor choose better medications, et cetera. And then, two, and then we also varied penetrance. We said only half of the people with a positive gene test would be affected uh, in order to model 50% penetrance. And what we found was that people with epilepsy in these families, 85% of the time, said they would definitely or probably want testing regardless of the penetrance. And if there was no clinical utility, 75%, so a significantly lower proportion, uh, but still a lot of people said they would want testing if it were offered. Um, the clinical utility made a difference. Oh, I'm sorry, the red bars are unaffected relatives. So even they wanted testing 75% of the time. When we said there was no clinical utility, we found significantly lower preference for testing, um, but penetrance made no difference. And then we asked people whether they would want testing for their offspring, and we divided it into parents with affected children and parents without affected children. And the results are quite similar uh, to what we found when people were asked about testing for themselves, that is, 86% of the people with affected children said they would want testing for a test with clinical utility, um, and 71% for a test without clinical utility. And even people who did not have affected children, the majority of them said they would want testing. And again, penetrance made no difference. So we asked them what their motivations were. And you can, here you can see the top five motivations that said they would make them more likely to want testing. Possibility that the results could improve health. Possibility to know if the epilepsy was caused by a gene. Possibility of changing behavior to prevent seizures. Possibility of learning if children are at risk. Chance to know some of your personal genetic information. And they also had concerns that made them less likely to want testing about the accuracy of the test, impact on privacy, impact on career, effect of insurance coverage. And you see here that some of the reasons they would want testing are not related to clinical utility, but simply knowing about the cause of epilepsy.
But then when we looked at um, how many people actually went through with testing, even though they had said they wanted it, there's a substantial proportion of people down here who said they would want testing and then said they would want to speak to a genetic counselor, but then stopped and didn't follow through. They didn't return the consent form for talking to a counselor. And we're still trying to understand what these differences are between preferences and actual uptake. And the last thing is that we examined how people's belief about whether or not epilepsy was genetic related to their experience of felt stigma. And we have different questions here to assess their beliefs about whether or not they have a genetic susceptibility. And we found that for this one, the role of genetics in causing epilepsy in your family, people who thought there was a big role of genetics felt more stigmatized than others. So I think there's something to be concerned about, whether people are associating genetics with bad outcomes or bad things. So. Just a very brief summary. This field is moving very rapidly. It's highly collaborative. It requires expertise from a wide variety of areas. And you can contribute by carefully collecting information about family history and uh, getting yourself connected with a group that's doing research in this area. Somebody made a comment. I think it's interesting that the psychological consequences of the testing, this is Bob Glover. Hi, Bob. Uh, that the psychological consequences of the testing is not mentioned as a reason people would not want it. Hmm. Yeah, that is interesting. Um, I don't. You know, we didn't mention everything, every possible outcome. Like some people have asked me, we had a list of 21 items. We, uh, we've actu we're actually interviewing people now, so maybe this will come up in the qualitative research. Um, but I don't think that was in the list the psychological. Well, actually, there was something like that, how the testing experience would make me feel. We tried, to, we tried to put it in as neutrally as possible, so they could say it made them more likely, to, likely or less likely. <clears throat> but that was not a significant predictor, one way or the other. Yeah. Anybody else have comments? Ah, in other words, anxiety, depression that might come along. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we have published a paper recently on depression. And uh, we did not find that genetic attribution, you know, as measured by the things that I showed you before. Let me see if I can make this slide go up. No, I can't make this slide go up. Yeah. So these are our three measures of genetic attribution. We did not find that these measures were associated with depression in the people who have epilepsy. But we found that the people who didn't have epilepsy, the unaffected relatives, were more likely to be depressed if they thought that there was a high chance that they had a mutation. So that was an interesting thing. In fact, their rates of depression, if they thought they had a high chance of having a mutation, was as high as the rate of depression in the people who already had epilepsy. Yeah. Any other comments? You're welcome. <laughs> Any other comments? 
Okay, well, if there's no further comments, we want to thank everyone for listening and thank you, Dr. Ottman, for presenting today.